My name is Andrew Stuck. I'm one of the co-producers of uh, Cloud Walk September, uh, as along with uh, Babak, who's um, on the screen as well, and he's the man on the controls. So um, I have the simple task just to uh, tell you that um, Cloud Walk September has been, been uh, delivered by uh, a huge number of contributors who've given up their time voluntarily, and we're not in a position to pay them any fees. We uh, we try to um, bootstrap ourselves through ticket sales and uh, asking for sponsors. And uh, the fantastic news is that this event has actually been sponsored. It's been sponsored by uh, Architecture Practice. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, Tonkin Liu. Um, uh, Tonkin Liu is an architectural studio based in London with a built portfolio of award-winning architecture, artwork, and landscape projects. Each of our projects is based on lessons learned from nature. Each aims to connect people to nature. Some use nature as symbols, mountain, river, flower, ocean, through simple stories that build on our collective identities. Some use weather elements that nature offers generously for free, sunlight, rainfall, wind, to animate architecture. Some learn from design excellence in nature, integrated systems, diversity, economy, means, form, equating to structure. Like nature, we design responsibly, iteratively, adaptively, inventively, holistically, and to aspire to achieve the most from the least. And you can find more about Tonkin Liu at tonkinliu.co.uk. But we'd like to thank them very much for their support. And I'm going to, uh, now, I'll tell you a little bit about our host, uh, that uh, Shemina Alakon. I hope I've pronounced your name right, Shemina. Um, Shemina is a sound artist, a researcher interested in listening to in between spaces, dreams, um, underground public transport, and the migratory context. She creates telematic improvisations using deep listening and interfaces for relational listening. She has a PhD in music technology and innovation from De Montfort University and is a deep listening certified tutor. Her major artistic research projects are the online environment, Sounding Underground, the Lieberhume Trust Fellowship 2007-2009, the Telematic Performances Network Migrations, and Intimal an embodied physical virtual system for relational listening in telematic sonic performance. Tamina is currently a senior tutor in the online deep listening certification program offered by the Center for Deep Listening and works independently in the second phase of the Intimal project that involves an embodied physical virtual system for sensing place and presence between distant locations. The co-creation laboratory for listening to migration for Latin American migrant women. So, Shamina, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the introduction and for inviting me to share this panel. Um, very key question about how do we seek tranquility in the current uh, known world context, um, which is uh, time that is kind of teaching us a lot about ourselves and, and the others and, and the planet. And today we have very three very special guests who will offer us their approaches on how they are seeking tranquility with their art and research practice, um, which is basically for me, art and research practices are extensions of, you, of yourself as the way of you can show um, what what is going on uh, and share it with others. So we will have here uh, Usue Ruz, Ruiz Arana, Richard Bentley, and uh, Ron Herrema. Um, Usue, uh, she's a, a landscape architect and lecturer at Newcastle University and her research is concerned with the role of walking and listening in the effective engagement with the landscape and the active use of sound in landscape architecture practice. 
So I will, for you to, to um, memorize each of them, I will um, introduce them as they will go. So I, I have started with Usu Usue, and she will um, <laughs> start to tell us about her, her work. So welcome, Usue. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so in keeping with the theme of this session, I'm going to talk about my own quest for tranquility, which I turned into a research project for my PhD. And in this project, I went in search of tranquility at Northumberland National Park. So I'm going to share some images with you as I talk through the project. And I'm also going to put in the chat a folder uh, with a link to a folder with three soundtracks. And if you could just open that folder for now, and then I will let you know when to listen to each one. So, so that's in the chat, and then I'll share my screen now. Can you all see my screen now? Excellent. So to give you a little bit of context in my research, as Shimena has introduced, I work with listening and walking as a trigger to enchantment. So I take enchantment in its literal meaning, a spellbinding through sound, and seek to reclaim a sense of wonder and respect for the non-human world through listening. And in my PhD, I went on a quest to find whiteness in my everyday environment, and moments of enchantment in it triggered by listening. But halfway through the PhD, at the beginning of 2016, I hit some sort of crisis, and this crisis was triggered by two things. The first is that I had just moved back to Newcastle after a year in Toronto, and I didn't seem to be able to find enchantment in my daily environment there anymore, because it was kind of unwise by comparison. And I started to wonder whether I might have missed something in searching for wildness in my everyday surroundings, as opposed to looking for pristine and remote wilderness. And the second aspect to this crisis is that as I was constantly listening, I didn't seem to be able to switch off and I felt that I was surrounded by noise. So in trying to solve this restlessness, I turned to Northumberland National Park, which is an hour's drive from home, from Newcastle. And Northumberland National Park is identified as one of the most tranquil areas in the current tranquility map for England that was developed by the CPRE, which is the Campaign to Protect Rural England. And I thought that if there was somewhere close by where I could find kind of the quietness and remoteness that I was craving, surely it was going to be in this remote landscape. So the tranquility map intrigued me. Um, tranquility is a quality that is highly valued in the landscape, as it seems to contribute to its natural beauty. And it's also conducive to the protection of the landscape. However, it's a subjective experience, and as such, it's difficult to map. So the tranquility map um, for England that was commissioned by the CPRE was developed through human perception first. So first, they identify factors in the landscape that people associate with tranquility, and then those factors were weighted and linked to features in the landscape for the mapping. The factors were both visual and acoustic, and positive and negative. And broadly, what scored highly towards tranquility was the absence of human influence. So, for example, bird song, silence, uh, seeing a natural landscape, they all score highly. And I was intrigued by the fact that this map was drawn from human experience, yet what we value in tranquil landscape is the absence of the human. So I wondered, uh, do we have a place in this tranquility? So on screen, hopefully you have uh, two tranquility maps for Northumberland National Park. And this map showed the tranquility of Northumberland National Park relative to itself. So if we were looking at this within England, everything would be the same color, very tranquil. But you see that there are some darker green areas, and these are kind of the most tranquil, and happen to be the ones that are farther away from the main roads. Um, so to solve both uh, my crisis and this intrigue for the mapping, I engaged in a project which I titled Silent Landscapes um, to question our presence in tranquil landscapes and in the process we enchant my life. The project was funded by uh, the Newcastle Institute for Creative Art Practice and involved me walking and listening um, through the most 
um, tranquilizers of the park with a view to test them up and also produce an installation at the end. Through the walks, I've found um, many moments of tranquility in quiet places, such as Barburn Farm, which is in the upper Cockatiel Valley that you can see on the screen. And in these quiet places, through listening, all sounds seem to amplify, including my own. And this is also what many of us have found during the pandemic closer to home. In this remote landscape, as you listen to your own sounds, you become aware of how you are an integral part of the landscape for others to sense. So if I can get you now to listen to soundtrack one of that folder that I sent, just the beginning of it, for a minute or so, you'll get a sense of the soundscape at Paroban Farm on a summer's day. But I also found um, tranquility in the loudest parts of the park, in the roar of the many waterfalls that energize me through the force. And what all the moments of tranquility that I experienced had in common was uh, two things. The first is that I was abstracted from my everyday life, so abstracted from my everyday kind of problems. And the second is that I was engaged with my surroundings in a deep connection, feeling an integral part of the landscape. So I concluded the project with an installation. This was a structure in one of the tranquil areas at Barbon Farm, which we've seen previously. And I organized a five mile round sound walk to mark the opening of the installation. And the purpose of the structure was to signify our presence in these remote tranquil places. The structure interacts with the environment as we do when we are in it, as other animals do when they're in it. The structure was made of waxed cardboard cones and sang in the wind and with the tapping of the rain. And it echoed the gurgling of the nearby burn. So the structure had an, an interesting ending as it was eaten by the ship the night before I was due to dismantle it. 
and many pe people found that this was the right ending for it, as the site returned to silence. However, I found this an expression of the complexity of the la this landscape our and our princess in it, as the sheep are there because of us, and the hills are barren because of them. So the tranquility map not always led me to tranquility. This sometimes was due to external factors, including weather conditions, seasonal change, and human activity that affected the soundscape. And sometimes it was due to my individual response, some landscape I just didn't engage with, like the one that we see on the screen, a vast conifer forest that had just been felled when I went. And I guess this highlights the subjectivity of the experience of tranquility and the complexity of the mapping. But what is important about this tranquility map, and this is what I like to end with, is that it invites us to listen. By being in this quiet landscape, we learn that we listen and that we make sound. We can find tranquility, but we can also become aware of the extent of our own sound making. As one of the participants of the sound work reflected, away from the noise of the city, you hear more and you hear yourself more. Becoming aware of our own sound making makes us question it. Not in the sense that we should not make sound at all, but in the sense of how we should sound. And we need to question how we should sound not only in this tranquil and remote landscape, but most importantly, in our everyday surroundings. So I would like to conclude well, by listening to the last soundtrack. Um, and when I discussed this installation with Scott Eiley, who promised the land where I put the installation, he was very conscious of the sound that he and his farming makes. And you'll be able to listen to some of that sound making uh, in the soundtrack on an early morning at the end of summer. Thank you very much, Sue, um, <laughs> for that presentation. And I will invite um, to the audience and the other participants just to type one word, each person, anything that comes out from this uh, presentation from Uzue for you. Um, I would like now to to invite our second uh, speaker, who is Richard Bentley. 
Um, so Richard Bentley is um, a lover of quiet spaces and the contemplative arts. Richard is currently completing uh, his doctoral research at the Sonic Art Research Unit at Oxford Brookes University, exploring the soundscape and its influence on our experience of positive silence. He also has um, an organization uh, called Small Silence, and, um, and the room is yours, Richard, to share. Um, your experience. Thank you very much, Yeah, uh, and thank you, yeah, uh, Babak and Andrew for uh, inviting me along. It's lovely, and I think I've got the uh, I've got my soundtrack to fall asleep to this evening. Thanks to Asura, so thank you very much. That was gorgeous. I could have quite happily listened to that for the for the whole duration. So um, yeah, when I I heard about the title. Um, of seeking tranquility, immediately my mind went into all sorts of different modes. Um, so what do we mean by tranquility? How is it different from silence and quiet and the like? Um, is it an outward search or is it an inward search or is it a mix of both, this this tranquility? Um, and also because of the, I, I, the, um, the photo that was used to, um, uh, to advertise the event had this picture of um, a lady strewn across a um, uh, a, a tree trunk, and it just got me thinking again about experiences of this kind of prejudice about who we expect to be seekers of quiet. Um, sometimes it can seem like it's a, it's a crowd filled with um, people who do yoga and meditation and and the like. Um, but in my experiences, I'll share with you in a moment. It's um, it's quite clear this is if not universal, very, very near universal. Um, and also this idea of seeking tranquility, is, it, if, is there a, um, if there is a stillness in tranquility, is it, are we seeking tranquility? Um, or is the, are we missing tranquility in that chasing of wanting um, and uh, chasing after tranquility. So thankfully, they would all taken far too, too long to uh, discuss. So I'm just going to sort of park them there as perhaps things we can come back to in the discussion uh, later on. Um, instead, um, I, what I wanted to do was actually just introduce some of the research I've been doing over the past oh, seven years or so now. I've been doing a part time uh, PhD at Oxford Brookes, as Shimina uh, mentioned. Um, and I want to show you, I want to read about how that played into um, the small silence organization uh, and how the ideas, it was kind of like a, um, uh, um, a bed that I was growing these ideas in over the years and it sort of um, turned into this organization. Um, so I wanted to um, um, explain something first of all, a little bit about the PhD that I was doing. <clears throat> it's sound, uh, soundscape and the experience of positive silence is the title I've come up with, just because it's, uh, it's the hardest thing, isn't it? I think uh, when you when you're writing one of these things. Um, but uh, what I wanted to um, uh, get across there was really um, that what I was looking at um, through a variety of um, uh, yeah, a variety of means, things like listenings, uh, writings, field recordings, and compositions. Um, sound walks with a variety of people did quite a few, including one for Sound Walk September last year. Um, installations, uh, did a couple of installations, uh, exhibitions, and also made some tranquility tours, um, sort of uh, GPS based tours that people could uh, take their own, as I say, their own path, but they were guided through uh, sort of peaceful, tranquil areas, uh, accompanying various sounds and uh, narration. And, bits of information for them, but all with an idea of trying to keep this idea of uh, uh, tranquility and peace, hopefully. Um, and the whole, the, the process really was for me to try and explore. I mean, it part was a bit of a busman's holiday, really. Um, I thought I love silence and meditation. I absolutely love um, music, sound and listening, field recording. Um, and um, with all the kind of, I've got a Buddhist uh, background, so it's uh, that kind of a mix of all of those. And I just kind of shoved them all into a PhD and uh, wanted to explore that. Um, and I thought it was a really nice opportunity to 
um, to spend some time in quiet spaces, indulge myself really. Um, but it was lovely, it was a wonderful experience. Um, and it's something that I want to now share with other people, which I'm doing through the Small Silence organization. So the kind of things I found, I'm coming to the end now, I've just, I've literally got to submit this commentary in the next couple of days. It's been a labor of love for the most part, but it's getting to the point now where I just, I want it done and in. Um, so some of the key points that I've, uh, things that I've um, found through doing this research, First of all, that silence and tranquility, excuse me if I just change between those two words, um, has a lot to do with freedom of, from distraction. It's not the thing that comes to mind immediately, but I think it's absolutely key. The more that I've looked uh, and uh, sat in silence and I've worked with other people in silence, what, what it comes down to often is that freedom from distraction, a freedom to try and, um, uh, a freedom for the soundscape particularly to support whatever it is that we're wanting to do, whether that's read or meditate or just let our minds wander. So that was one key thing I found. Another thing was um, silence has often been, you know, been measured in, you know, uh, and associated with kind of pleasant sounds, natural sounds, and that's absolutely fine. And even sound levels, which is a very dubious measure of tranquility, if you ask me, but it can, uh, it can all contribute in some way. But what was really important, what I think is one of those um, one of those aspects of tranquility that really is missed, is that it changes your thinking. Uh, and I don't know. I was going to ask you, Sue, about this when she was out in, in the uh, Northumberland National Park, which I'll do later. But how I always found that when you're in a um, in particular environments, when you've got uh, visually, when you've got things at a distance, but also when you've got sounds at a distance. It changes your thinking um, and for me this thinking can become slightly more abstract and also you get that that sense of well-being and I was trying to go what is this uh, what is this sense of well-being that you get from that and how does it change your thinking to sort of the, the bigger issues um, and I've sort of done a lot of I've, I've delved into psychology maybe I shouldn't have but I, it was a, it was a I think a useful um, uh, useful exercise and looking at something called psychological distancing, which is where um, objects at a distance, sounds at a distance, try tend to trigger more distal thinking, um, so more abstract thinking. And in terms of our own well-being, that can often mean that the everyday experiences that we have throughout uh, throughout the day need to be brought together in some kind of narrative, often what's called narrative identity, that we need to fit all these little experiences into some big, into some story of where we've come from and where we go to, where we go to. Um, so for me, that seemed to fit with my own experiences as this distal thinking was helping to assimilate and cohere all of these various little experiences you have through the day to create this narrative identity, which is absolutely essential to um, good functioning uh, of, uh, and good mental health. Um, so I can't really go into a lot more detail now, but it's, I just found it fascinating. And then, as I've mentioned, as I think already, is that I, I tr did installations and public, uh, I had public quiet spaces on the back of quite strange bohemian carts down the main high street, um, all sorts of uh, little interventions. Um, and what I found is people have a real appetite for quiet. And it's not just the yoga um, meditation types, it's everyone. And I, I did an installation in the um, in the Broad Street Mall, which is a busy mall, uh, had a huge variety of people come along for that installation, which was a, it was a lovely place to have it. Um, but what I found was it, it's not something that's elitist in the slightest. Now people might go to their allotments or, or you know, tend to their gardens, stick their headphones on, listen to rain, rain apps and you know, those um, uh, kind of ambience apps. Um, and yes, people do, um, do need quiet. Um, so if I just say something briefly, I'm now I'm probably running out of time, but just something about one of the, uh, one of the pieces of work from the PhD that I think is, is now um, being moved on to some uh, uh, sort of a bigger project. So I did an installation, this one in the Broad Street Mall in Reading. It was a disused uh, shopping uh, um, unit. I built a big cube. I've now got to get rid of it, but I built this big cube. I had quadraphonics uh, speakers set outside and some inside for a kind of surround sound experience. And I just played people the sounds of local quiet spaces. 
which I'd done while using, I can see Antonella's on here as well, using her quiet um, Hush City app. Um, and I did some recordings as I was going. So I played these back in surround sounds um, and just let people wander in, sit in the cube in darkness, very secluded spot, and also sit outside in the Mall, which is a little busier, but it was, um, yeah, still quite a, um, a relaxing experience um, from, from the feedback. But what was interesting again was this, this uh, sense that the people came in, um, often they come in every lunchtime because they really wanted to sit in the quiet. And once they knew I was there, the days kept coming back. Um, and also um, that people would have really deep conversations with me afterwards. They'd often sit in quiet and then they would tell me I had a couple of soldiers, ex-soldiers come and talk about their PTSD and how they like to sit in tranquil areas to help them, um, uh, you know, uh, manage their PTSD. Um, people talking about their anxiety, um, uh, depression and the like. And so in strange, because I was a, a virtual stranger, but this, the environment and the peace, hopefully, and tranquility that was provided there allowed people a different space. And I think this idea of it changed people's thinking, it changed people's um, mode, uh, and they slowed down a little bit and also were very free in talking about these things that were really troubling them often. Um, we did have some happy conversations, but on the whole, these were these were people that that, that liked that silence because it really felt um, a support in a way and a, and helped them to to uh, to share these things. So along with that that installation, I had a um, a nurse from the local intensive care unit uh, came along, uh, and she sat in there and said, "Oh, really? This is brilliant. This could, I could really do with this for my patients." Um, so um, so we got into a conversation. She invited me down to the intensive care unit and um, the small silence now, we're now developing a project. Fingers crossed we've got funding for this, we'll know shortly. But where we're going to be working with the intensive care unit um, to try and improve the soundscape. I don't know if anyone's been in the hospital, hopefully not, but I'm sure you, you know that soundscape, full of bleeps, whistles, people chatting at all hours of the day, um, particularly in the intensive care unit. Um, and it was it's a really, disturbing environment in many respects. So what we're planning to do is to bring those soundscapes to the patients through iPads at first um, and help them to, uh, you know, to tune into the soundscapes uh, and various other slow media, um, which could be music, ASMR, um, it could be slow video as well. And what we're doing is hopefully we're going to get local community groups, arts and mental health groups, to produce a lot of the content. So some will be professionals, um, professional artists, um, some will be amateur artists, and then we've also got a, a variety of, uh, of uh, people from the mental health, arts and mental health groups. Not that I like to see pigeonhole artists, actually we're all just artists and creatives, but um, so we're hoping to develop this, um, this project and then provide these patients with something slightly nicer to listen to. Um, you could just go on YouTube, but the idea here is here that the actual process of creating the content should hopefully allow, uh, should be quite therapeutic in itself. But also that all of the content, well, pretty much all the content is going to be locally produced involving local, not just local artists, but also local soundscapes. So we're hoping that it'll have a local reference and enable patients to be grounded in the tranquility and, and the kind of local tranquility, whether that's down the pub, in this kind of quiet pub perhaps, or whether it's by the, the canal. Um, and we're hoping to see to pilot and, and to see uh, if patients respond to it well and uh, what do they choose. Um, so various other projects on the uh, that have developed from the PhD, some sound walks, wellbeing sound walks that we're doing. Um, uh, we've done various online projects, our Sounds of a Town, which gets people to tweet and Facebook post about their favourite sounds, the local sounds, as a way of in gently engaging with the environment in hopefully quite a mindful way. Um, and various tranquility trails as well. So I think I've talked for long enough. I think my little, <laughs> my clock's gone over time. So I will stop there and um, allow Ron to speak. I don't want to use up his time, but thank you very much. It's, um, it's lovely to share this after seven years of largely being in your own head. It's been really nice to share it. So thank you very much. It's nice to meet you all. Thank you very much, um, Richard. Um, so I would like the same uh, from the audience and all of us just to have one or two words. The first things that Richard 
uh, sharing inspires us. One of the wonderful things of the chat window is that it helps us also to pose a bit, no? <laughs> um, and share, share in a kind of um, verbal um, spoken experience, but it's not sounding, which is interesting. Okay, well, um, I welcome now to Ron Herrema. Um, Ron is a composer of music, sound, and image. Uh, he's a digital multi-artist and an app art developer. Uh, he has a particular but not exclusive affinity for algorithmic techniques in all his creative work. He has also uh, been especially interested in integrating contemplative practices with technology through creativity. For the past four years, he has been also a senior lecturer in creative computing at Bath Spa University. In 2008, he began his study of deep listening practice with Pauline Oliveros and eventually became certified to teach deep listening. He continues on a daily basis to look for ways to flow creatively into, with, and through the world. So the floor is yours, Ron. Okay, well, thanks very much, Jimena. Um, it's really lovely to have been invited uh, to this forum. I thought the other day I was thinking how I really can't imagine a nicer thing to be asked to talk about than <laughs> tranquility. And uh, a few nights ago, I um, I was having trouble sleeping, and so I, I just uh, while I was not sleeping, I was thinking about tranquility. And I, one of the things that I thought was that mindfulness of tranquility leads to tranquility, that it was a kind of a, a self-fulfilling uh, pursuit as I thought about tranquility. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, connect a few dots with my talk. Uh, Richard was talking about stories, so I'm going to try to tell a bit about my story. Art. Maybe about my place, uh, as, we've been, as we've been talking about tranquility, I'm sitting here looking at the moon out the, the window. And I'm about 40 to 50 feet from the River Avon. Uh, we live right next to the tranquil, tranquility inducing setting. It's lovely. I'm, I've gotten into the habit during my COVID uh, lockdown of, of riding my bike through the, the hills of Somerset. I've never been to Somerset. Um, lovely place to be if you haven't been here. Already. So I don't often think of tranquility. Uh, it's one of the reasons it was nice to be asked, but I do often think of serenity. Um, and I think of serenity as something that's a bit more internal and enduring. And I think of tranquility as ephemeral. Not that I'm making any kind of value judgment, I'm just thinking. Uh, but I have sitting on my desk this uh, stone. I don't know how well you can see it. It's a piece of soda light. When I bought the stone, I looked it up and I found that one of the things it symbolizes is serenity. So the fact that I have it sitting on my computer, I think, says something about the kinds of things I like to pursue in my daily life. Um, so I was also, as I was thinking about tranquility, I was going back in my own story and thinking about when, when did I start to like tranquility? When did I start to experience it? So I was thinking about a couple of um, connections. One was uh, sitting in church. I was raised in a quite religious uh, atmosphere, and so I went to church for a week. But the, the parts that I really enjoyed were the uh, prelude and the offertory when there was some very quiet tranquil music being played on the organ in my church. It was a real organ. My sister happened to be one of the organists. Uh, so that was one of my earliest experiences of uh, tranquility. And so I have this association with music. Um, and the other is uh, uh, where I'm from. And I found it very nice that uh, Christine is here. And so she's from the Midwest. If you're not from the Midwest, I'm from Michigan. Uh, Michigan is a, a state of many lakes. That we have the big lakes, but we also have many small lakes. Um, and I always found being by the lake uh, a nicely tranquil experience. And so I have an association. And the sound of lakes. 
of many styles of whales, which includes, for example, motor boats. <laughs> so, I, you know, motors of motor boats I don't actually find offensive. Some of them are more tranquil than others. Um, so, I've done I've done a, a, a a few different contemplative practices in my life. And one of the things I found when I started studying meditation was that I tended to enjoy walking meditation. So I think I have a kind of a predilection for being in motion. And I had, for quite a few years, I worked in jobs where I was moving a lot. Uh, felt like kind of moving and able to, to work out my tensions. Uh, so when I, when I became a full-time academic, and a full-time teacher, I found that I had to sit, spend a lot of time sitting in the office, my desk. <laughs> that was quite easy to become tense. And by that time, I had learned how to write computer code and how to generate me. So I decided that what I would do to help myself relax was to write a bit of computer code that would generate music kind of ad infinitum on an indefinite basis. And eventually I uh, produced an album of that music and I called it uh, Music for Being. And so I'm gonna put a link in chat now and ask you to spend a minute or two uh, going to this link and just listening. Um, I mentioned a couple of uh, things about that. Uh, sort of in terms of the process, I. I became quite fond of this process of, of trying to write very small amounts of code um, to generate uh, lots of music. And um, I associated that with uh, Taoism. So I've spent some time reading the Tao about the Tao, about the Qing, and, and the Wu way of non action, the strength and power of of small actions being able to generate <clears throat> large results, which is uh, for me part of what the Tao is about. Now, the other thing is that um, Richard was talking about hospitals, and we actually had a friend who, uh, when she was in hospice, uh, listening to this album of mine was favorite things to listen to. Very proud of so uh, moving on with my story, eventually I started to take this practice of writing code and generate to the graphic realm. And uh, so I started doing generative graphics. So I just want to show you. Uh, okay, so I did a series of images, uh, again, by writing generative uh, code called Vingfolds. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a few. Uh, all these images were generated by running the same algorithm. And eventually, uh, I decided I wanted to combine the two worlds, the music and the sound, but also to animate the uh, images. So uh, I became an app developer and an iOS developer. And I have two apps uh, that combine this idea of uh, doing meditative artworks, um, audiovisual works. And so one of them is called Dancing Wu Wei. Uh, and the other one is called Infinity. A uh, similar, similar app in terms of its objectives. Uh, one of the interesting things about Infinity uh, for me, uh, Richard was talking about kind of finding tranquility in unexpected places and from unexpected people, even maybe. Um, when I was doing a, a user study with this app, Infinity, uh, one of the users that I interviewed said it reminded this process of, of encountering this app was for her like a cigarette break. And it uh, completely reframed my sense of what cigarette breaks were for. I always thought of them as uh, you know, people indulging their addictions, which I suppose are on one level it is, but also I started to realize that people take cigarette breaks, enter into a kind of a contemplative state. Um, and so wrapping up, just to talk about what I'm doing these days, um, 
I have uh, something called the Music for Armenian Ensemble. So I want to have. I was trained as a classical musician. I'm a pianist, um, and so I've started something called the Music for Armenian Ensemble, which involves me writing, kind of letting just music flow on, on the morning of or maybe the day before. I'll write down some very simple music. With the ensemble, I play it and we play it in unison. We have no objective of performing it, of perfecting it. I use minimal amounts of directions. It's just notes on a page. The idea is that we're just uh, playing together. Uh, and that, so playing music has a kind of form of meditation. Any objective except except to be have an awareness of, of being playing. Makes any sense. Um, so I think I think that's enough for me. I'll, I'll just leave it at that, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ron, for that sharing for that music. Um, actually, I I was originally thinking first to open the floor between you three, but I was thinking that I will change in this moment my mind and open the floor to the audience for any immediate question that you might have here for any of the three uh, speakers, and then we can offer them uh, to exchange between them. But, but first, the the audience. So, is there anyone who has a a question, a comment, an awareness. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, that would be me, maybe. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Thanks, guys. This, uh, I think this was great. Um, and I have, well, I can easily have a dozen questions. <laughs> um, first, a remark for Ron. I do not seem to be able to find infinity uh, in my app store, sadly. Uh, it's also a question for Ron. Are you able to briefly share something on what the algorithm was that you used to create the images that you shared on Flickr? Yeah, sure. Okay, so the Infinity app is an iPad app. Uh, the other, so uh, Dancing Wu Wei is an iPhone app, but Infinity is an iPad app, and those two worlds are a bit segregated on the App Store. Um, and in terms of the algorithm, the, the, the things that I like to work with uh, are noise. Uh, there's a particular algorithm for noise, which is called Perlin's noise, which is ubiquitous in uh, actually gaming industry because it's used to generate organic shapes on the fly. Um, so I was using Perlin noise in the images, and I was combining that just with uh, simple sine waves. Uh, so it's a kind of an interaction between this you know, complex relations of sine waves and program noise. Thanks. And indeed, uh, I find your app uh, for the iPad. Thanks. Great. great. Um, and also a question on your music. Uh, the piece that we listened to, that was also algorithmically produced? Yes, yes, totally. So does that mean that um, you could keep on producing these works uh, at infinitum? Yes, yes, yeah. That's kind of my, so you, yeah, that's my tactic. I'm sorry? You should start your own radio channel 24-7. Well, I have thought of this, establishing a YouTube channel, yeah. As a full-time lecturer, I found it difficult to, to fit in, but I have thought of a YouTube channel. But the, the beauty, YouTube, you have to upload. The beauty of uh, a radio channel is that you plug in the parameters for your uh, algorithms and it will turn out co music continuously. You will never have to do anything about it again. You're, you're correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll give it some thoughts. Good idea. Ah, thanks. Um, and I also have a question for um, Richard. Um, you several times said that you were in the Mao, and I have no idea what you're referring to. So yes, I've probably done my the 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 mall, the Mao, the um, uh, which is a shopping centre in Reading. Um, right. <laughs> that's mall. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mall. Yes. I mean, there's a number of different ways to <laughs> pronounce that, but yeah, it was just a shopping mall. Uh, had a lovely spot though. It was right right by the entrance. Lots of through traffic. So yeah, 
um, yeah, did a wonderful job. They were good. To, uh, yeah, it was good to have their support. Thanks. Great. So actually, I didn't give a space to if people want to write anything that came out from uh, Ron's music and well, things are coming here. Uh, but I will put my bit to um, about small actions. And probably I would like to ask um, about this um, to the three of, of you, <laughs> just taking the small actions proposal from, from Ron. Um, I wonder um, how small, well, I'm bringing this a small silence of uh, Richard organization and, and about the measure, this idea of measures. So I wonder with Usue, how do you see your, your work? Is it something that could you say that is kind of a small action or, or, or a measure of, of your actions there? I think um, one thing that I, that I found with tranquility is perhaps that we need big actions as opposed to small actions that is not enough to protect this quietness. We need to think big. We need to make listening integral to every part of our practice. And this is very relevant for me as a landscape architect, but everyone working with the environment. So we need to kind of make listening integral to everything that we do. Uh, at the moment, um, all kind of built environment, architecture, landscape architecture, urban design are very much peacefully focused. And it is only in these quiet places where we think through our ears, whereas we need to actually take a big action and make listening integral to everything that we do, because we have such a big impact through any of our interventions in the soundscape without realizing it. So perhaps it's not so much small, but actually when to think big. Um, that's interesting. Thank you. Yosu, how about Richard? What do you think about this measure? Yeah, no, I think it's um, it's very important. Uh, Yosu is quite right to, to think it's good. we have got to think bigger. We haven't got time in terms of the climate crisis, particularly. We haven't got time to think <laughs> too, uh, too small. I think the two can go together. I think, you know, it's good that my organizations called small silence it's those little moments of silence in the day that people can grab often and, and that's where that comes from um, but in terms of I mean had the uh, the lockdown and the quiet of lockdown that will be forgotten very quickly um, by most I would imagine because we then will very quickly just get used to the soundscape returning to the way it was I think as sound people sound artists sound scholars um, activists we need to capitalize on that um, that memory of quiet and uh, try and use that as a means of instigating change uh, um, so uh, it's critical um, and we do need to think uh, we do need to think big uh, maybe that that means thinking you know that um, thinking locally first and trying to find things out, but we haven't got the, in a sense, we haven't got the luxury of time. Um, mm -hmm. And I do think there is a, yeah, I think there is um, that uh, maybe a slight pressure on us to 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 you know to act um, in a way that we can use that uh, our set of skills um, in. A constructive way to 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 join, whether it's increasing biodiversity and getting people um, use, uh, using and valuing quiet spaces, um, remembering how important they were in the lockdown for a lot of people, particularly in cities. I was I'm very lucky. I've spent I did a project where I just went to the local village green for a month. Um, it, the sound, in comparison, probably barely changed. Um, it's mm. it's quite tranquil out here. But people have very different different um, experiences in the in the towns and cities um, where those quiet spaces were absolutely crucial 
uh, for people to get out, get out of the house. And I know I've got three daughters, <laughs> I'm dealing, but yes, everyone needs that, 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 those spaces to kind of retreat mm. to, recover sometimes from, mm. uh, recover in. Um, but, but, but beyond that, we need to be thinking about using that impetus, using that, mo that, um, mm. um, that momentum, uh, mm. try and capitalize on that to try and, uh, you know, um, uh, to protect our environment and the planet um, as a whole. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a big ask and it's a short time scale really, but um, mm. yes, I think we I can just, play a part in, in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, there is kind of a big kind of a need and uh, that we need to do something and, and going back to, so this is for Ron, um, I recently had experience of um, of uh, working with someone who works with permaculture and I was comparing it with deep listening which is one of the questions here from An Andrew so I want to take this um, and and give the, the question to Ron but is that um, I realized that permaculture um, uh, spends I mean people who work with permaculture spend kind of 80 percent just observing the land and 20% in action. So let's say this is a small action and I was remembering uh, deep listening is, is a practice uh, developed by the composer Pauline Oliveros uh, that uh, help us to or invites us to expand our perception of sound as it, as it um, uh, travels in time and space which, which I share with Ron and um, and I was thinking that Pauline used to say uh, or taught us to first listen before we sound, so to spend more time listening. So it's again about about kind of dimension. So so I take back again this the deep listening and the small the small scale uh, with the biggest scale. What what are your thoughts, Ron? Uh, yeah, well, thanks. I, uh, a prompt because it made me realize that when I engage in my sort of compositional practice of doing small actions that lead to big results, that I tend to think in terms of time. But it's also, I, I realize now, it's also about space. And there's something about tranquility, about expanding the sense of space, I think. Um, there's a, maybe there's a, actually a connection with the cosmos, basically. We can be in a, in a kind of a small place, but if we are tranquil, expansion is that small. Uh, and to maybe follow up and try to expand a bit on about deep listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always, I always think of deep listening as a hybrid practice. I describe it as a hybrid practice. Um, and Pauline was a, a student of Buddhism and she described deep listening as it was focused on listening and sounding and especially on input. But it also involved uh, listening with body, so doing uh, Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, body energy work, and also listening in dreams. So those are kind of the three uh, pillars, you could say, of the deep listening practice. Um. Now that you mention a space, uh, one of the common things that I got from your three um, talks, which were actually really wonderful and calm, <laughs> um, it was about the crisis. So Usua says that her practice came from a crisis. Uh, Richard, although not necessarily with the word crisis, but I'm thinking of this um, project of with IC, ICUs, which is kind of a critical state <laughs> of the body that we, we don't want to be, but, but it's a space where people in critical condition um, are. And Ron, you talk about the stillness or the crisis of being in a work that is tense, and this is how you develop that. So. I wonder how with those experiences in crisis, how do you think the crisis that we are living right now, the world crisis, could lead us into something, uh, I mean, as, as artists, researchers, as people in general, um, 
lead us into into a different dimension of space and um, and practices. Um, yeah, how do you envision that? What what can be possible? Um, we can start with um, Usue. Yeah. Well, I think in in this crisis, people have reconnected with their immediate environments because we haven't been able to travel that far. People are discovering, for example, their neighborhoods and their local tranquilities, uh, in part because um, there's less noise, but also in part because we are not going anywhere. So people are kind of uh, working from home. Um, and I think there's something quite wonderful in rediscovering a sense of um, neighborhood and community as well. So people have come together to help one another in a way that it has never happened before. So I think this crisis has, has had good things and obviously kind of very bad things as well, but it's something that we need to take forward in many different ways. Um, so on, on a listening perspective, but also on a kind of human side as well. And I think that's that's the bit that we can't forget. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. How about you, Richard? Um, I don't know if this is going to go off topic, but in terms of crisis, um, I, mean, I was thinking about what does tranquility mean? Um, for my own practice, um, tranquility, and I mentioned distraction, but tranquility is um, is gained through insight, insight into our suffering, um, insight into our um, our fears. And I think at the moment there's a lot of people that are, are very fearful. Um, and even before the COVID crisis, I think uh, there's this kind of existential angst, particularly in Western um, Western countries, but I think it could, you know, um, wider than that, because we've lost the world views that um, gave us hope. That, um, and uh, I'm not saying I would go back to them necessarily, but um, I think there is uh, this this need for tranquility goes really deep because it's a need to face our fears. And there's one thing that silence does is it holds up a mirror to our fears. And so if we're going to cultivate tranquility, we've got to familiarise people with silence because it's the silence that will show them their fears and being comfortable with that. And I know it's really uncomfortable. I know <laughs> I've sat in a few retreats where I've just wanted to go, and, you know, get, get in the car and go home because all of a sudden the things that you don't deal with because you're so busy. And I know we live in an attention economy where um, our, our attention is being grabbed by um, all sorts of interests, um, very seldomly supporting our own intentions. Um, and we need to capture some, recapture some of that. We need to, um, in order to, to deal with those underlying fears and to take action. And let's face it, I think the figure was something like, if you're gonna deal with something like the climate crisis, you need about 25% fear and you need about 75% hope. Um, I think we've got about 75% hope, uh, fear and about 25% if that of, um, of hope. Um, I think there is, uh, there is a need to use our practices to, to um, connect us with what is right um, about, the, uh, about the environment through the soundscape and to develop some of that hope that the future could be, um, it could be better, it, it can be. Um, and I think that's a message that gets so lost in the media because it's, it's not very, <laughs> uh, people are easily dragged in by their fears. Um, I think the message of hope is really, um, it's, it's very thin on the ground, um, but incredibly important that we a face our fears about this crisis. And I know I've been doing a practice called the Five Remembrances, um, which is a practice where you have to you confront your death, your old age, your sickness, um, and you visualise yourself dying. And the rest of it sounds very grim, but actually, what it brings out in doing those kind of practices is that sense of, um, of facing your fears and it, funnily enough it does bring out hope and, a, and a, a, an appreciation for what's going on in the present moment 
because you know life isn't life's not going to go on forever the people that i love will you know will pass who knows when and i think there's that is that that's funny dynamic um, i think sound artists and uh, and musicians and others have have the uh, ability to to help with that um to a produce uh, to, you know to create environments with tranquil but also supportive so that they can people can face themselves in silence which i think is incredibly important and also generate that hope and i think that's as i said so crucial um uh in in all of our practices my brain tends to move in all sorts of strange directions but um i don't know to me that that you know in the current crisis is that mixing and the balance isn't right at the moment i don't think i think people are switching off because they can't face that crisis um and the uh, and what it could bring um so it's easier just to, to switch off from it unless we get that balance right i don't think we've got much hope of um, um of, of of helping people um and ultimately, I think <laughs> I'm sure a lot of our, I get, you know, you, you get that impression that that's, that's very much about what, what we're about. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, sorry. That, I hope that Thank makes you, some Richard. sense. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. How about you, Ron? Well, when you asked the question, I thought immediately of my students and my relationship to my students because I'm a full-time lecturer. One of the things I've been telling people about the lockdown is that delivering all the uh, classes online, which I do now, is that my relationship with my students has improved. Um, I feel that I have a more actually intimate relationship with them, a more leveling, a sort of uh, egalitarian one. Uh, they're in their space, I'm in my space. Uh, when we're at the school, it's an institution, there's a kind of power relationship that's built into the, into the structure and the format. And so I guess maybe, you know, it's kind of taught me that there are other, <laughs> there are other possibilities in terms of how to uh, have students. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was uh, very helpful. And um, there was one other thing I was going to say. <laughs> oh, no. Well, thank you. I would like to open the floor here for Mel, um, who, yeah, was talking about tranquility slash piece um, uh, suggested by Richard uh, that she can uh, comment on that or please smell uh, or anyone else in the audience uh, who wants to comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you everyone. It's a um, really lovely interesting discussion. Um, I feel that one of the things that for me is that actually I feel enormously positive about everything. Um, I think that we are spiritual beings in having a human existence and I think that actually all of this crisis and the Covid, actually what it's doing is connecting us more to our spiritual nature and I think sometimes you've got to go into the dark space in order to see the light and I think it is um, for me, I have felt more connected. I feel that there are more people talking like this about spirituality, about consciousness, about connecting to who we are, you know, who our true nature is. Um, and to me, that's wonderful. You know, it's just so liberating um, that through all the noise, and the, as Richard was saying, the fears that come up, um, all these deep emotions actually are taking us to a better place. And I don't think 20 years ago when I started to work in health, I would never have used the word spiritual or I would have used it very, you know, ooh, you know, what are people going to make of that? They wouldn't have understood it. And now we use the word spiritual. We talk about um, connecting to who we are. We talk about our soul and our purpose. And people just, it's kind of quite normal. And so therefore, I think that it's a very, actually very positive time to be, um, to be working in this field, to be to be connecting people to who we are, which is consciousness, which is what I did for I did a 
daily meditation um, and just getting people to explore who they are, which can actually only be done through finding silence through and, and you know that practice could be meditation it could be it could be it doesn't matter to me how we find silence all that matters is that we need to find that space for the seed to be planted to grow into the flower the tree of our potential and who we are and i think all of this is actually touching our soul so when we experience tranquility um uh, silence space consciousness we're actually connecting with who we are and that's the most wonderful thing that we can do and just finally is to say that for me tranquility and calm comes from within so when i was listening to the that lovely ambient sound of the sheep bleating you know it made me think actually i can be outside in a field in northumberland listening to sheep being with the sheep but i can also be sat on my bed like i am here and listen to the sheep bleating and visualize that sheep and visualize being in that place yet i'm in in my house in my room i'm not there you know so really it, it opens up such a big question to me is where do we find tranquility is it does it always have to be in the space where we are or is it coming from within and to me one reflects and begets the other thank you <laughs> i hope that made sense thank you thank you well a wonderful question actually it seems said two two hands there, Ron and Richard. Yeah, please feel free. Uh huh. I know. Sorry, it's, it's I talking about. Uh, okay, I is good here actually. Um, it would be nice to hear from Anna. Uh, do you want to share what you're saying here in the chat? Your experience, yeah. Um, we cannot hear you. Yes, yes. Uh, my English is not good to speak. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I wrote uh, uh, how I think about this experience of silence uh, departing from inside. Uh, if I understood what uh, Mel said, uh, departing from inside. Because I live in a, in a city with a noise all the time, almost all the time. I will sleep at uh, nine o'clock. I will sleep very early, I know, uh, with noise. And I wake up, uh, I wake up uh, with noise. <laughs> uh, but my experience, uh, personal experience with um, tranquility, some uh, silence um, is through my imagination uh, and it's through uh, a deep, deep listening to my breath and uh, heart beating. Uh, when I, I am a runner, I, I, I run and the, uh, this is magical to me. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, yes, definitely. I actually, I did a, a work a lot in uh, transport systems, very, very loud in some of the biggest cities in the world and, or, or um, yeah, busiest and uh, particular Mexico City, one of the biggest cities and how people found meditation practices in the most noisy spaces, like waiting for the or the metro or inside the metro um but the but the, the imagination is a powerful powerful tool so thank you anna for bringing that and also about the embodiment how when you go back to you again from within uh, linking with with mel um and and also yeah from within about, about the heartbeat and probably something that richard was saying in his talk is about this uh, decibels, um, the measure, again about the measure, not necessarily we probably need to find tranquility by literally bringing down the decibels of 
things that probably sometimes we cannot. I mean, this is kind of a, a big question, but, uh, but it's great to have the tool of our imagination. So thank you so much and going back to the heartbeat. Um, and I probably would like to, to start to wrap up with, with a question. Uh, and please feel free in the audience to, to put more things in the chat um, and I will grab them. Um, but it's about going back to this abstraction. Um, I think you both mentioned abstraction. Um, uh, Usua mentioned abstracted from everyday life. And then um, Richard followed with, with the thinking of, of the di di distance, about distancing and, and abstract. And then, well, Ron's music, music is kind of a very abstract art in itself. So I wonder about how, how do you feel the possibilities of that abstraction and how that help us with distancing and also uh, distancing not necessarily of being far distant, but, but about managing how close, how far we are, how we balance that. Um, what are your intakes and abstraction? Probably I will start with a more abstract, as I say, art, and Ron could correct me, but I could uh, start with you, Ron. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Music is kind of famously uh, uh, abstract, although it's very, you know, you know body-oriented as well. And body. um, it's, a, it's a cliche, but uh, to write music, uh, is to speak in a way that I cannot speak with words. And so in terms of my own tranquility as a creator, it's deeply satisfying. And I'm very rarely uh, as happy a person as I am. Um, it's, it makes it possible for me to express myself in a language that, yeah, it's a cliche, but it's a language that I, like I couldn't possibly do with words. Thank you so much. How about uh, you, Urs Ursue? Yeah. Um, for me, the abstraction perhaps goes something close to what Mel was talking about, um, this spiritual being, but it's abstracting ourselves from kind of our cultural beings. So you abstract yourself from um, your physical space, your normal physical space, but then abstracting ourselves from technology as well, abstracting ourselves from even from time, so that we are, we share many things from with people before us and after us, but we share many things with kind of animals as well. So it's kind of becoming, feeling part of Earth, I guess. So it's achieving some sort of inner state where you feel a deep connection, perhaps it's a spiritual connection or it's a kind of physical connection with um, everything. Um, so with animals, with earth, um, so yeah, it's abstracting yourself from, I guess, your everyday life, your every problems, but from in different ways, physical abstraction, technological abstraction, and people achieve this state in different ways. So you've talked about uh, both um, Ron and Richard about contemplation, meditation, and these are ways of abstraction as well, of abstraction. So. Thank you, Sue. Going back to Richard. Uh, yeah, I think there's some lovely comments. And I, I completely, I was nodding away with Ron there about the the, the music um, and the abstraction. I, I love that piece. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've got it ready to download in the moment. Um, but it's, yeah, it was beautiful. Um, and there was that, both the abstraction using the algorithm, you were never quite sure what was going to happen. There wasn't anything that you could grab hold of in terms of the structure easily. There was a tempo, there was, there was some kind of pulse going through it that you could feel. But other than that, it did, um, yeah, it was abstract enough to let your mind sort of soften with it. And I think I, I know exactly where you're, you're coming from with when you're writing music. Um, and it's funny, you know, you mentioned Wu Wei and the idea of doing, and that's obviously the Chinese for uh, basically doing nothing, being inactive. Um, 
and that's another way of abstracting or ex extracting in a way ourselves just like Usui was in Northumberland you're kind of extracting yourself from society and in this way by doing nothing it's kind of a it's a protest in a sense I think sometimes against the um, the onslaught of um, our you know distraction our attention economy distracting us and so I think that's music helps us to you know and particularly I find that you know uh, your piece one really helped me to to distance myself from the immediate concerns and to to get some space and some tranquility and I also I just wondered as well Ron is it a slightly different issue but I love big reverbs um, and I don't know and I always thought maybe that's because I grew up in a church as well um, in fact I was meant to be a vicar um, never happened um, but I wonder if that that's played into your um, into your music that that sense of space and distance um, and, in the in the way in the production of it as well there is this lovely sense of space i don't know if we've got time to start but it was just um well it's I a nice know, I felt really I mean, real connection I, mean, I, I have to admit i you know maybe because i did grow up in a church i actually like church spaces uh, like those big reverberant spaces and they do have a way of uh, kind of fusing uh, of this you know, of erasing some distinctions in a way blending things together um, i mean technically it's a uh, convolution reverbs which are essentially ways you know technically of putting you in a particular space literally as as, as close as you could be literally to be in a, in a in a space a very big thanks thanks for the comments though. To, to close these comments about, about the, it made me think of one of the Usue's work, um, which I didn't, uh, it probably was the last one that you invited us to listen, but uh, it has a kind of, not reverb, it has something, it, it had a filter. And, um, and that definitely sounded sounded that was not part of that landscape originally. So it was kind of an intervention that ended with the anecdote of the sheep eating the, <laughs> the intervention, which I found it very, very interesting. But how this, um, how this, how did you think of, of this intervention and how, what was the relationship really with the, with the landscape? thinking of, of a space where we have completely a different uh, space than a church in, in contrast. I think that the original plan was to kind of try to signpost the, the most tranquil parts of the park. So you would have, um, like you have visually in some parts, you have viewpoint here. So you would have something that would signpost, you know, quiet, quiet this point here. So that was the kind of um, original intention of it. Um, and then when I was walking and I became very aware of kind of my own, own sound making in this um, tranquil landscapes, I thought it would be nice to actually not only signpost the quietest, but also signpost us mm -hmm. in it. So something that would make noise as we do, but without being overly powering. So is um, kind of an amplifying instrument that kind of what it really does, it amplifies your own sounds and the small sounds on, of nature in there as well. Um, so, yeah. And then it was quite an isolated space. So I needed to work with um, something that I could construct from small pieces because I wouldn't be able to take it there in a car or anything. I needed to walk there with all my um equipment so it was um yeah mm -hmm. working with that but, yeah. thank you it's also interesting the the fra fragility that you is part with these cardboard um uh, boxes because it's not necessarily the installation of uh, metal or protective but it's precisely something kind of fragile um, yeah. in the immense kind of landscape which i found it very very nice, very powerful, actually. Very powerful. Uh, yeah, Babak? Um, I have a question for uh, any of the panelists. 
whether you have um, uh, a vision or an idea as to how institutional change on a societal level could be instilled to work towards uh, a mentality of uh, appreciating tranquility or quietude uh, more. Well, I'll just uh, the first thing that comes to my mind, Babic, is um, some people have. I mean, because I come, I'm very connected with the tech industries, so software development. Uh, for better and worse, um, there's lots of talk in recent years about fast prototypes, uh, but there's now also a movement of slow prototypes, <laughs> which I think is really nice. Um, so that you know, it, it would be great if we could have more movements like that, and if uh, maybe we can also slow down learning. Um, lots of things that we try to do rapidly, if we could slow them down, we might benefit. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Slowing down is a kind of keyword that is coming around. I was just, um, yeah, it's a really important question, actually, Baba, and it's it's not an easy one to answer. Actually, it's incredibly difficult. Um, I think tranquility sometimes has an image problem. I think it can be tied very much to a certain group of people. Um, and I th if I mention this, some of the places I work, if I was to mention tranquility or uh, some of the things we've talked about today, the pe people aren't going to engage with that. They're not going to, it's quite, not necessarily understand the importance of it. I don't think, I think there is a, a, a real problem with the language that we use and the kind of spheres in which we move. Um, I think there's some great ideas out there. Uh, and I think we've, you know, we've heard about some of those tonight, the Tranquility Map and the, the apps, which are very much engaging people at where they are and with technology that they're familiar with. I think that's brilliant. I do think there is a, um, there is a real problem with the way it's portrayed um, and the kind of circles that in which we have these conversations. Um, I think breaking out of that's really important and not not easy. And I, don't, I haven't got any quick solutions, and I don't think there is any quick solutions. Then <laughs> maybe some slow ones. Um, but I think there's that. Um, it's going to take. It's going to need to take lots of different angles. But I think the important thing is to talk people's languages um, and to convey, if we're talking about tranquility, to convey the benefits and the importance of tranquility to people who might be switched off by the kind of language that we all use um, quite frequently. Um, and that is not one language it's going to fit. It's about um, understanding who you're talking to and, and putting things in a language that they will um, where they can see the importance of, um, uh, of tranquility in their own lives. Um, again, that's, I don't know, is this, it's not a, <laughs> oh, we'll just, you know, like a lot of these things, it's not just a quick, oh, yeah, we'll do that, that'll be fine. I think there is a, um, but there is a real need to talk about tranquility in a, in a, and in a language where people, the, the person you're talking to will understand and to experience that, not just to talk about it. Um, and it's interesting, um, again, in that abstraction that uh, you know you get. You're, you often um, there's that feeling that uh, that words aren't enough, and sometimes sound can do that. Can get past the words, the miscommunication. People will listen to the music. People will engage with an app, uh, you know, and um, often with wordless formats because there's no the message is very much, and with a lot of art, the message is sort of internalised and interpreted in a particular way by that person. It doesn't need to. You don't need to um, always um, put things into words in order to convey them. In fact, often without words, it's far more powerful. Um, that's very vague, um, but I'm going to have to leave it there because <laughs> I don't think I can do any better at the moment. Work in progress. 
Well, I will say in terms of time and space, <laughs> probably is the time to start to close and to give us all kind of sense of tranquility. And one, one input from uh, deep listening is uh, when we just wrap our hands <laughs> and um, we make a hit, that is what we can make. And uh, once we have this enough heat, and of course we most of us are with headphones, but I'll invite you to remove the headphones for 30 seconds while we put our hands warm in our ears and close the eyes. we connect again back <laughs> a huge thanks to our speakers today and to Andrew and Babak for open this space and to Mel Anna for your contributions and to all the listeners who are uh, in verbal silence but are there with uh, big big listening so thank you Well, um, having rubbed my hands together and uh, held them up to my ears, I um, I could hear the sound of the tractor in uh, Usu's uh, final um, soundscape. Uh, <laughs> so something is going on in my head. Um, anyway, uh, lots to think about and um, a really lovely discussion. So thank you very much to everyone who uh, contributed and. Um, we want to thank once again Tonkin Liu, who sponsored the event, um, and uh, we would like to invite you to uh, join um, other events in Soundwalk September. There are a few more to come. Uh, I think we have uh, three or, or four events over the weekend, and tomorrow there's a, an event which is uh, uh, about text and landscape. Um, where I, I think I'm going to, uh, I'm expected to say something which is a bit frightening. I haven't prepared anything, so <laughs> I better get to work. Anyway, thanks once again, Shamina, for for bringing this uh, panel and sharing it so well. And thank you, Richard, Ron, and Usu for um, your contribution. It's been really valuable. Thank you very much, and uh, stay safe and calm wherever you are. <laughs>